There's history here. And here. There's history there. History is everywhere. Hey, can everybody hear me okay? Thank you so much for coming. This has been a really fun um, kind of research project for me because my specialization has always been the Bracero program, primarily in Oregon and in the Rogue Valley. So I found my way to the POWs in looking at who was working in the pear fields during World War II in the orchards. And POWs were one of the groups. And so from there, I started to investigate who who these POWs were. And um, what I'm going to share with you today then is some of what my findings have been to maybe shed some more light on who these couple thousand men who stayed here for a couple of years in the mid 20th century were and uh, what happened to them. Uh, so I also realized some of you, I think, come to a lot of windows in time. I know that Joe Peterson, who's another historian, did a talk on um, the POWs and specifically the classified re-education program that the United States um, attempted during our time holding all these POWs. Um, so he's already laid the groundwork for a lot of that. Um, so what I want to do is keep my comments related to that somewhat brief, um, but this does play a role and I'll explain a little bit more as I go along. Um, I do want to give my nod and say that a lot of what we already know about these POWs is from um, Peterson and a couple of others um, that live or lived here locally that have done some of the research and written some of this down. So in general, the United States did a great job caring for its POWs. Um, and to put this in perspective, before I get into the way that we treated the POWs out at Camp White, which is now White City for any of you that aren't familiar, um, I would like to briefly compare the way that POWs were treated by other, um, other belligerents in World War II, um, specifically the Russians, the Nazis in Germany, the Japanese, um, as well as the British we'll be talking about a little bit as well. Um, I find that other people tend to say things more concisely than I can. <laughs> I'm kind of a rambler. So I do want to read for you very briefly a, a quote from, an, from G. Kurt Peeler about these conditions um, of the other powers. So he writes that Soviet soldiers captured by the Germans were often summarily executed or faced brutal imprisonment in camps that provided little food or medical care. In turn, the Soviet Union reciprocated with similarly harsh treatment of German POWs. Most died in captivity, and those who survived would not see home until the mid-1950s. Japan committed scores of atrocities against the occupied peoples of Asia, beginning with China. Japanese forces visited brutal treatment on American and other allied prisoners of war, um, forced marches such as the Bataan Death March, um, summary executions, starvation diets, forced labor, and inadequate medical care took a horrendous toll on those taken captive by the Japanese. Yet despite all this, and despite the unspeakable cruelty of the Nazis toward the occupied peoples of Europe, they adhered to the Geneva Convention in their treatment of American and British Commonwealth soldiers. Um, this is a really important distinction to make, and I'm not saying all of these things about the way that these POWs were treated elsewhere to be inflammatory, it's supported with the evidence. And so what we're looking at with the way that the Germans treated Americans and with the way that we treated the Germans is really a unique piece of World War II history in general. Um, I'm also kind of wanting to acknowledge before I get too deep into this that some of you may very well have your own personal experiences and stories to share, um, perhaps about the time that these guys were here or uh, maybe that you've heard from others. Um, so I do want to leave some time at the end, hopefully, for some questions and comments and any additional information. I'd encourage you to share um, anything that you can add to this. Um, one of the things that I find is unique is that if you ask a typical long-term resident of the Rogue Valley about the Camp White uh, POWs, it, I, sim I get a similar response almost every time um, if they have some sort of knowledge. Um, I generally hear stories about friendly German POWs, um, often engaged in the local pear harvests, and these stories have been passed down as one of the features of the Rogue Valley ever since the war. For those that aren't old enough to remember these stories themselves, the story tends to stay the same because they've been told so many times in so many settings, and so now it's almost local folklore. Um, nearly all of the locals have associated these POWs as men from the Africa Corps who could cook, they could sing, they could even produce art. 
Um, these local tales tend to stand out as much more interesting, um, in my opinion, um, but in others as well, than the VA domiciliary that followed um, pretty much standard care for a long time for a lot of veterans. Um, nowadays, the VA source has a different function, um, but for some reason, POWs in Camp White seems to be something that still elicits that real interest. Um, for any of you, by the way, who have not visited the Camp White Military Museum, it is a wonderful place that's full of information and artifacts from not just World War II and not just POWs, but pretty much um, anything relevant to this area and to the former Camp White. Um, so it's out there. One of the things that's on display is the art of German POW Georg Zorg. Um, he was trained as an artist, he wasn't particularly famous, but while he was here, he produced some beautiful pieces of art, like the one you can see here. Um, excuse me. From what I understand, there are still some pieces of art that are kept in private households that he produced as well. Um, he was giving them away to people that he made connections with, um, such as guards or um, people that he came into contact with. I do want to point out I have circled this hat hanging up on the corner, and that may seem odd because we're looking at a beautiful piece of art. But to me, this hat, as inconspicuous as it seems, was something that was really important for my research. Um, because the local folklore about artists as, as captives is interesting, but it doesn't tell the whole story. This is actually an Africa Corps cap, so that helps us to identify where he came from before he was captured. Here's a sample of another group of Germans that were taken captive in North Africa. And you can see that their caps match. They have this, oops, make the red pointer work. They have the similar cap with the kind of soft, uh, floppy, long bill. And it's, it rises quite high in the front and fits very fitted in the back. So when I was looking at some of these photographs, hopefully I'm able to identify some things that others might not have noticed before. So the intent of my research in this respect was twofold. Um, first, I wanted to seek a more nuanced analysis of the prisoners of war that were held in Camp White. Namely, who were these men? Um, were they hardcore Nazis before they arrived here, or were they something else? Um, were they all Africa Corps fighters, or were they more diverse? I learned that simply lumping the approximately 2,000 POWs as Africa Corps fighters is not accurate. Although the first big wave of captives to the US in general and to Camp White specifically were generally from the Africa Corps um, or the North African theater. Second, a key point of German-American interaction that requires some further analysis is the disputed role of the secret re-education program that featured an attempt to democratize the soldiers. The effectiveness and dubious legality of re-educating prisoners remains somewhat contested ground in existing scholarship on POWs. So this is the stuff that you guys probably don't care as much about, but this is kind of the lifeblood of historians. We like to argue with each other and pick apart our arguments all the time. That's why we have jobs. So <laughs> this is kind of where Joe Peterson, as I mentioned, has focused. So I will try to keep it brief, but it really connects into this, as you'll see when I get into the guys' backgrounds. Um, I would argue, however, that this classified program was not effectively planned or implemented, um, at least not in Camp White, and its overall effects, if any, were outweighed by the simple adherence to the standards set forth in the 1929 Geneva Conventions. While the term Nazi is also convenient for brevity, um, I, do wanted, I, I do want to be specific that most of these prisoners were virulent, card-carrying national socialists, um, for those of you that know your fun terminology. So today, I will briefly share with you some of the highlights of my examination of these prisoners' units at the time of capture, their experiences in camp, and the general tone of prisoner-resident interactions. In all, this information sheds some light on the ideological climate within Camp White, um, especially within their POW compound, and ultimately, these POWs were a lot more like us than you might imagine. With that in mind, I do want to emphasize that since these men did come from diverse backgrounds, um, I will generally avoid the term Nazi because it unfairly flattens these historical actors, as does defining each simply as Africa Corps. So first, a little background. Camp White was one of over 150 POW base camps in the United States during World War II, and it did house quite a few of Erwin Rommel's Africa Corps fighters. 
It's located about seven miles north of Medford, um, or at least it was, and Camp White presented a unique experience not only for the prisoners, but also for the residents of Jackson County. Completed in just 10 months, Camp White's more than 1,300 buildings within the nearly 44,000 acre cantonment area became a behemoth compared to its very rural surroundings. As many of you may know, its original purpose after 1942, um, when it was dedicated, was as a military training camp. Work crews converted much of what some of us refer to as the Agate Desert into firing and artillery ranges, and even featured a model Nazi village that units like the famous 91st US Infantry Division trained on in preparation for deployment to Europe. They didn't go to Europe, but they trained on it. <laughs> they were ready. Many of Camp White's buildings were also used post-war all over the valley. You can still see some of them. They were sold off publicly and privately. Um, in my research on Braceros, they were used as housing for these Mexican guest workers for a time as well. In 1943, when the US began receiving prisoners of war from North Africa and from the British who were completely overloaded, think small island, lots of captives, um, a small area of Camp White in the camp's northwestern corner was converted into POW barracks, and it was fortified with a double row of barbed wire fencing. So overall, Camp White was this huge place, but the POWs in just a tiny corner garnered a lot of attention for themselves. This was a pretty unique thing for the US. This was also one of the first camps on the West Coast. And Camp White's first 400-man contingent arrived on April 16, 1944. So that's a bit late in the war. The men's living conditions have been described as Spartan, but generally comfortable. Um, they featured two-story barracks that housed between 80 and 100 prisoners each. Three other camps in Oregon, Camp Adair in Northwest Oregon, Camp Warner in rural Southeast Oregon, and I'm gonna claim it for Oregon, Camp Tule Lake, which is in Northern California, um, also near where they were housing Japanese interns. Um, they were all opened as branch camps under the Commandant at Camp White. And so there is a little bit of administrative confusion when it comes to who controlled what, and um, I will explain that as well in just a moment. Um, camps like this, these, sub camps or these, these camps off of the base camps were even more numerous than the 150 or so base camps. So total in the United States during the time that we were housing POWs, there were more than 600 camps nationwide that were housing German, Italian, Japanese POWs. When it came to Camp White, I wanted to take a closer look at the diversity within the prisoner cohort, including as much of the German perspective as possible. I noticed important nuances among the prisoners themselves, as well as how the political and the social climate in Germany prior to and during the war informed these men's sometimes radically different perspectives. One common belief among Americans in charge of the POW programs was that the POWs needed to be introduced to basic democratic principles. Camp White was not unique in that regard, hence the classified re-education program that was hastily put into place. Historic historians generally conclude that at best, the program achieved mixed successes, and at worst, nothing at all. So no brainwashing really occurred. Um, but the problem was, from our perspective, we didn't realize that many of these soldiers remembered democracy in Germany, and some had even voted in open elections prior to the Nazi consolidation of power under Hitler in 1933. Hitler himself was democratically elected, for those of you that aren't familiar with your German history. And so from the American assumption that Germans simply needed to be shown a better way, um, we wound up misstepping somewhat. Um, however, there were organic shifts in these prisoners' ideologies as their time in captivity went on. Their humane, dignified treatment in American hands that simply adhered to the Geneva Convention standards was key because of a couple of factors, um, reciprocity and comparative treatment. So as I mentioned earlier, among the other allied and Axis powers, if we had abused German captives, the Germans would have then taken their American captives and reciprocated. And so it was well known the way that each of these groups were treating their prisoners of war. And so that was a very visible and very clear indication of how we could expect our own GIs to be treated in enemy hands. So, now for a little background on how this humane treatment was administered, because it's not just as simple as treat them well, as we're currently seeing on our southern border. That's 
another kind of similar episode that's ongoing. So at this time, the War Department took responsibility for POWs on U.S. soil, all POWs. Um, they worked in cooperation with the State Department, with the Office of Censorship, with the U.S. Post Office, and the Department of Justice. POW oversight also didn't end there. The Geneva Convention mandated that neutral civilian observers from the Swiss legation could access POW camps to ensure the proper treatment of enemy soldiers. Um, if you're wondering why the Swiss I could make a joke about why the Swiss are always neutral, but realistically they were the nation that were assigned to oversee the Germans at this point in time. <coughs> so each camp had a prisoner elected spokesman that could communicate with this neutral legation as well as with other authorities. At Camp White, prisoners elected a POW named Walter Escanodas, and he had the ability to correspond with the Swiss observers to address complaints, um, to ask questions, to address any concerns as they arose. Um, typically, we see these concerns being things related to if somebody's promotion or um, merit of rank had been recognized before their capture, and if they could get that insignia while they were captive. Um, so pretty mundane things were actually being reported to, to the Swiss and forwarded over to the German High Command. Interestingly enough, this elected spokesman in Camp White was one of the ideological hardliners. He was a real Nazi, and interestingly, he was, like Hitler himself, not German. So um, Hitler was Austrian, Eskenotis was of Greek extraction. So it's another one of those interesting bits of history. So the Geneva Accords allowed all prisoners to wear their uniforms, as well as retain and wear all insignia of rank and decoration. This is my favorite picture that I have found of Camp White, and I'll explain why. Um, German prisoners were also allowed to salute while they were in camp, despite the German salute's very strong association with Nazism today. Um, that was something that was also protected. So I do want to show you why it is that I think this photograph is so interesting. Because you can see here that all of these men are in uniform. Their uniforms change color somewhat. You can kind of see the way that the tones change. And unfortunately, we're dealing with black and white. So I'm going to show you an example of the tropical uniform that was worn by the Germans at the time. Um, so this was from the tropical service, i.e. the North African Front. Um, it was designed basically to give them a little bit more camouflage, but also to help them in the extreme temperatures that they were dealing with in North Africa, ranging from as high as 140 degrees Fahrenheit during the day to below freezing, as low as 14 degrees at night. So that's kind of the color that we're looking at here. Most of the time, as the war went on, the quality of these uniforms degraded, so they would fade to a sandier, kind of grayish brown. This is a photograph of a Waffen-SS uniform. So that's a different gray instead of a green. Um, we did have a couple of those guys in Camp White, not many, um, but that's another example of some of the uniforms you'll see. So it's kind of one of the things historians do in movies. We always point out how the uniforms are wrong. <laughs> so Camp White only held enlisted men. It didn't have any officers. And so this guy, you can actually see some rank of insignia on his arm here. He is not an officer. Um, he's not even a non-commissioned officer. He is just the highest level of an enlisted man that he could be at that time. Um, the general equivalent in the US would be a lance corporal. We can also see that he has this ribbon on the button in his lapel. He has one right here, as well as this gentleman up here, and this gentleman over here. So that's actually the Iron Cross second class. So the Iron Cross also has the, the black kind of um, cross that they typically wore right about here. Um, what happens is that that's only for the dress uniform. So for everyday use, you wear the ribbon. And so these three gentlemen had done something in battle to be given such a high honor in the German military at this time. Um, typically, it's for particularly brave or valorous conduct in a battle, um, if you were an officer, typically if you had made a call that had changed the tide of the battle, this is when they're handing out the Iron Cross of any class. You can also see that this gentleman up here has um, some markings on his lapel, and this is often confused with the SS Death's Heads. They're not. This actually is a different kind of skull 
type marking. Um, this signifies that he is a tanker. And by the light color of his uniform, we can infer that he was in North Africa with the Panzer divisions. Um, he also has a couple of distinctions here. He has some badges. Actually, a couple of these guys have similar badges on. Um, the darker colored badge is a wounded badge. And so these men had, it's similar to our Purple Heart, they've been wounded um, and obviously survived, but they were captured before they were sent um, back out to be wounded again. Um, the lighter colored badges uh, relate to the specific job or the specific um, field that each of these men were in. And so that is a merit badge for good conduct in battle. So these, these were all soldiers, and they knew it. You can also see that their ages vary wildly. These two gentlemen in the front look quite young. Um, they look about high school age to me, but I'm not a very good guesser. Um, the gentlemen on the sides that are kneeling look significantly older. So you can actually see there's quite a bit of variation in age among the POWs in Camp White. You can also see, it's very difficult to tell. Um, there are a couple Luftwaffe men. This is one of them. The eagles on their lapel change shape slightly as, as you look at the, the Army versus the Air Force. Um, and so that, that is another way that we can help infer who it was that these men were. So <clears throat> there's another way that we can figure out who they were as well. There were roughly 371 to 400,000 German POWs in the United States total during the war, uh, as well as additional Japanese and Italian prisoners. So each of them were assigned a serial number for ease of tracking, kind of like we do with our own GIs. These numbers really facilitate an analysis of the men's pre-capture role in the German armed services. So here's an example of these serial numbers for you. The first part of the number up here, I'll start with the one on your left. Um, the first part of that number represents the theater in which the men were captured. 81 is for North Africa, so you can see we have a North African capture right here. 5 was for the Western Defense Command, and 31 was for the European theater. Next came a letter that represented their country, G for Germany, because we're using English at this point. Um, the remainder of the serial number was unique to each prisoner, the 26012. So that is that prisoner's distinct number. It goes with him everywhere, no matter where he's transferred, um, within the country or from Britain to the United States, for example. This system, however, originated with the British. And thousands of prisoners who arrived on US shores had not yet been processed abroad. So rather than just tag along to the British system, we had to make our own system. <laughs> So these captives had different indicators. So you can actually tell where these men were processed. Um, the indicators from the American processing are a little bit less informative. But at right, they feature three symbols at the beginning. So the first symbol uh, represents the Army Service Command, which was linked to one of nine US military districts. The second symbol, W, stood for War Department. And the third represented the initial of the country from each, uh, that each prisoner had hailed, uh, followed by the prisoner's unique identifying number. So it's not Chinese once we actually figure out what this means. So here we have a Camp White POW who was processed abroad, Wilhelm Eritz, right here. And his serial number began with 81G, while Gerhard Nagel was the 8WG. Um, both of them did come from the North African theater, and both of them were captured just days apart from each other, May 9th and May 13th, respectively. So the latter didn't get formally processed until he had arrived in the US. Why? Because they were inundated. And so it was just luck of the draw, who got processed where and when. Um, the, the real obstacle was making sure that we had security and transporting men as they were captured, usually in larger and larger groups, to somewhere secure, whether that be um, holding stations in North Africa or uh, POW camps in Britain or the United States. According to the statistical average that I took from the 949 prisoners listed in an October 2, 1945 Camp, Wet, Camp White manifest, we figure out a little bit more about these soldiers. So the average age in the camp averaged 27 and a half years suggesting that many of the men would have been at least 15 when Hitler took power in 1933. 
So I don't know about you, but I remember quite a bit from when I was 15 politically, just following the news. Um, these men represented nearly 42% of the total in this sample and can be assumed to have had clear memories and experiences growing up and living in the Weimar Republic, which was put into place between the two world wars. Democratic principles, therefore, could not have been totally foreign to many of these German POWs in Camp White. The exceptions are those who were very, very young. The, the boys and young men who had been more thoroughly indoctrinated into Nazi ideology tended to be those that had grown up um, mostly past 1933. So we can see some of the 17 and under the teenagers, um, the 18 to 20 group. A lot of these guys right here would have been more likely to hold the beliefs that they had been taught in Germany um, a little bit closer to the heart. So other than ages and um, some interesting insignia on uniforms, who were the men in Camp White really? Rommel's Africa Corps does appear in the records, with many having been captured from Panzer tank divisions in North Africa. Um, that is where some of the most famous and the largest tank battles in history have occurred. Um, in these battles, we have the Germans and the Italians largely under Rommel at left here, uh, fighting British General Bernard Montgomery um, with the Americans joining later. So you can see here Rommel has his tropical uniform on with all of his insignia. But I would just show you as well what the North African front looked like. It doesn't look like what we would expect of a war. They're in sandy deserts and they're spreading out um, to make sure that they're not making too big of targets of themselves out in the desert. So here's some more of these Germans that were captured in the North African front. Some of them went to England, some of them came here. And again, it could have been every other. Um, it was completely mixed by the time that we started accepting captives. Who went where? Thought I'd add, this is the Africa Corps emblem, um, which I was just eating at In-N-Out Burger the other day, and I noticed if you add a swastika to the front, there are some similarities there. <laughs> I just ruined In-N-Out Burger for everyone. I'm sorry. So beyond the Africa Corps, we have a large number of men that came from Flugabwehr Kanona, because Germans like compound nouns. So you're going to see a few more of these. Um, they're flak divisions for short. What they're doing is they're operating uh, anti-aircraft guns mainly, as large as the big 88 uh, millimeter ones. These guys were not necessarily tied to the North African theater. They operated um, linked to other uh, Wehrmacht groups all over. Um, Europe and elsewhere. Um, but the capture dates and the intermixing with the panzer groups in this batch that came into Camp White suggests that they were supporting their comrades in North Africa before they were captured. Perhaps the most interesting feature of the groups of POWs that spent time at Camp White was how different the men really were beyond this first large group. They ranged in age from 48 to as young as 16. Some even represented groups with strong anti-Nazi bents, at least in principle. For example, men from the 999th Africa Corps consisted of inmates of concentration camps with a sprinkling of criminal convicts added in. These men would have been either communists, um, people that were otherwise critical of the Nazi regime. They perhaps would have been labeled asocials, or they were other suspect characters that were put into these units and made to fight. Camp White lists 13 men from the 999th. Most of the smaller groups of prisoners filtered in late in the war, with capture dates listed from mid-1944 and beyond. These counter the popular assumption that all came from the Africa Corps, and frankly, they add a lot more to the story. The late war timing is really significant, as June 6, 1944 marks the beginning of Operation Overlord, the D-Day Allied Normandy invasions. Um, after that, the Allies made spectacular progress in pushing the Germans east, while the Russians were making even faster headway in pushing the Germans west to meet in the middle. In fact, not all of these post-D-Day prisoners had, that made their way to Camp White were even frontline soldiers. Seven hailed from the Reichsarbeitsdienst, or RAD. This group was a pre-military youth group that drilled with spades rather than rifles. You can see their spades right here. So these are some young boys. 
These young men ideally ranged in age from 18 to 25, but late in the war they incorporated younger boys as well as shifted in function from work crews, digging things like irrigation ditches, to auxiliary support for Wehrmacht and Luftwaffe uh, units late in the war. So here you can see these RAD members are firing one of those large 88 millimeter flat guns as Luftwaffe auxiliaries. Another example is that 33 POWs came from Volksgrenadier, or People's Infantry Division units. Um, their name sounded far more patriotic than the men who joined their ranks. We're going from the very young to the very old in this point, um, respectively. Old for serving in the military, at least. After autumn 1944, when the Russians began to reverse the earlier German advances, these units were named to build morale, or esprit de corps. So Volk in German is people, so they wanted it to be the people's units and to um, create some sense of, of benefit, I guess. They, they wanted the men to feel like they could win, and so they sent these men out. These men were given quality gear and weapons, um, but they were really makeshift units at their core, which explains why they were so hastily put together toward the end, and then they fell apart very quickly once they came under fire. Other POWs in Camp White hailed from Landeschutzen, or regional defense or security units. These were also hastily combined units, and they carried a second class designation and were comprised predominantly of older men from 35 to 45 years old which if you think about what you were doing between 35 and 45, it's probably not wanting to fight a war. So these men would typically not have been fit for duty earlier in the war. Um, they also were comprised of some reservists as well as some who were injured. <coughs> Camp White's POW cohort also had men from Bau Battalione or construction units. So these weren't soldiers at all. Um, they also had some miscellaneous army, mainly infantry units, some Luftwaffe or Air Force units, including some from the Hermann Göring division, with that fun uniform over there, <laughs> and three Waffen SS men. So only three from the SS. Um, interestingly enough, Hermann Göring, who you probably know his name, um, he was so adamant that he could have lots and lots of men in the Air Force that he had more men than he had supplies for. And so a lot of the Hermann Göring division were actually land-based infantry in the Air Force because they didn't have enough planes to give them. So the Geneva Convention, which US military authorities made sure to adhere to, encouraged prisoners when they were in captivity to engage in both educational and sporting activities. In fact, the German high command publicly supported prisoners' engagement in productive diversions as well. So this, this had support from both sides. These diversions actually formed the basis for the US-led re-education program, but they did tread a fine line. Propagandizing the inmates was strictly verboten. I had to throw that in. <laughs> so hence the challenge of Lieutenant John Fahey, Camp White's re-education program coordinator. He was one of 150 officers heading this classified program nationwide, and Fahey faced many hurdles in attempting to carry out his objectives. For example, he spoke no German. <laughs> so it's a little tricky to re-educate, especially in a subtle way. Um, the only two other US soldiers in the camp complex who spoke German um, were not necessarily assigned only to deal with POWs. And one of them happened to be Jewish. And so that, once the news of the camp started to come out, presented a challenge for communicating with those who had no English skills. In the end, the hospitable treatment of these prisoners won more hearts and minds than any explicit democratization under the program, and it did open for the prisoners, this is the more important part in my opinion, access to classes in English, in government, in a wide variety of other subjects that they could learn about. Um, this was completely voluntary. Nobody was going to force them to. And so it, the interest that prisoners had in just learning new subjects is pretty remarkable. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. One obstacle to training these men or teaching them is that the Geneva Convention said that only POWs can educate POWs. So it was illegal to bring in an English native, English speaking native to teach them English. It had to all be taught by the POWs. Um, and that was something that was written into the Geneva Conventions to try and avoid um, this attempt to propagandize or to um, brainwash any sort of POWs. <clears throat> 
The program secrecy itself uh, meant that the scope of Fahey's re-educating was pretty limited as well. Um, but he did have some control over the educational curricula, and that included access to, uh, for example, books in the camp library. Um, in Camp White, these restrictions were not taken as far as they could. The YMCA donated a lot of books in both English and German. Um, and when one of the prisoners one day asked if he could read Mein Kampf, they, he said, OK. Mm -hmm. So the prisoners really had access to pretty much any sort of reading or educational material that they wanted. Um, the important part here, I think, in why this was not a successful program is this misunderstanding that the Americans had um, about Germany and German history. So many simply assume that these POWs didn't know anything but dictatorships and propaganda, disregarding the pre-Nazi experiences that the prisoners openly discussed with their captors. So here's the clincher. While democracy was no foreign concept, the Germans' collective experience in the Weimar Republic was not typically viewed in a positive light. Um, democracy in general, because of this, was a structure that was generally tainted with very negative connotations to men that were sitting in Camp White and other camps um, waiting for the war to end. So um, the establishment of the Weimar Republic after World War I, and from the German perspective, the very punitive Treaty of Versailles, led to fierce competition among German paramilitary groups, royalists, moderates, and even communists, within which the Nazi party represented one of many competing voices in the chaotic interwar political environment. So I'll just give you an example. If you think our current political process is a little convoluted, imagine nine dominant parties vying for control. So to top this perceived lack of order, the ruined economy led many to associate democracy with disorder rather than prosperity. I'll note, I incidentally colored this the color of the German flag, but the Social Democratic Party, the Communist Party, and the National Socialist German Workers Party, or the Nazis, these were three of the uh, most, well, they shouted the loudest. I won't say that they were necessarily the most influential um, at any one point in time, but they were the most visible. The Americans who spent this interwar period between the two world wars, um, we weren't paying attention to Germany. We were paying attention to ourselves. We had the Great Depression, we had the Dust Bowl, and then we were focused on internal recovery with FDR's New Deal programs all through the 30s. So it's really not surprising that we didn't fully understand all of these important factors that were informing the POW's perspectives on democracy from their own experiences with Republican-style government over there. Because of this misunderstanding, the Americans' subtle goals to expose and teach the POWs about the perceived superiority of democracy often fell on deaf, or at least skeptical, ears. Um, however, most POWs spoke very openly while they were here about how well the American system worked once they saw it, and they admired its plentiful resources, its free speech, and individual freedoms that they were able to witness. So most claimed while captive that this structure was great, but it just simply couldn't work in Germany. Um, so we have a little bit of a conflict going on here. The root of the contradiction really is that these Germans only understood democracy imposed from above. Um, by the victors of World War I, rather than an organic citizen-led effort that characterizes the American experience that we just celebrated last week. <laughs> While most POWs housed in Camp White really did live comfortably, they had fairly lax security and relative freedom in their daily activities, they did remain prisoners. So not a, it wasn't a requirement, but hundreds of POWs chose to spend their days working for local agriculturalists by harvesting apples, peaches, pears, and other crops when needed. In general, the guards treated their captives as equals, or at least as non-threatening. So I want to share with you two of, I think, the most illustrative anecdotes that have been floating around the valley that kind of show this, this treatment of guards and captives. One of them has to do with being transported from Camp White to the fields. Um, in many cases, if you've ever climbed onto a, a big box truck, it's very difficult to get up without having both hands. So it was pretty typical for guards at Camp White to hand their rifle to Fritz, who had already climbed, yeah. climb on, and Fritz would hand the gun back. And then they would ride along to wherever they were going and then repeat the process. 
And so these prisoners weren't particularly threatening to their guards. Um, the other anecdote is uh, Al Inlow, who's I think still out at the Camp White Military Museum. He's a fount of information. But he says when he was a teenager, he used to work out in the pear orchards uh, during the harvest time, and he would work a couple rows down from POWs, and he'd hear them whistling and singing songs in German, and there would just be a guard on one end and the other end of the row with a gun, just kind of relaxed, watching, making sure nobody tried to make a run for it. Um, if you've ever been in the pear orchards, though, you'll note that there's not just two ways to exit the rows. You can go laterally as well. In Oregon overall, 3,517 POWs, mostly Germans, worked in Oregon agriculture from 1944 to 46. In Jackson County, 77 are recorded in 1944 and 300 in 1945. While POWs never represented a majority, their farm placements, um, mainly part of a larger labor program administered by the State Extension Service at that time, helped fill in critical gaps in labor at peak harvest times. Mexican guest workers, or braceros, uh, women's land army volunteers, teens and children working in gangs, also as volunteers, and POWs all helped out when regular labor was insufficient due to wartime shortages. According to the Oregon State University Special Collections Archives and Research Center, which is um, open to the public, it's up in Corvallis, POWs in just Malheur County were largely responsible for 7,500 acres of potatoes, 3,500 acres of lettuce planted and harvested in 1945. Also in 1945, POWs harvested nearly half a million bushels of pears in Jackson County, that was the 300 of them, and 3.8 million pounds of hops in the Willamette Valley. Many chose to work because they enjoyed the diversion and the weather, which if you've ever spent time in Germany is fairly similar here, um, except less extreme in the winter. This was not unique to Camp White or Oregon either. Historian G. Kurt Peeler confirms that POWs were frequently lightly guarded and that soldiers assigned to watch them consisted of those too young, too old, or physically unfit to serve abroad. So, Prisoners also had access to materials that would be explicitly banned for fear of prisoner breakouts or violent actions in, for example, American prisons today. So this knife was made by one of the POWs and he was allowed to keep it. Mm -hmm. And this beautiful wood carving set was also made by one of the POWs. And both of these are on display in the Camp White Military Museum. In some cases, the POWs in Camp White left camp on their own recognizance to go work in local orchards or for other local businessmen. Um, only the PW was visible on their outer clothing, oops, to mark them as unfree when they did that. So you can see here we have the PW, you can kind of see a P on one arm, the W on the other. Um, oftentimes their pants were also marked with a PW. Some ventured farther to hops harvests 30 miles away in Grants Pass and others to Klamath County, which at that point was a voyage of 111 miles by highway to assist with the potato harvest around the Tule Lake branch camp. The War Department encouraged POWs to work though they could not compel officers, so that wasn't a problem in Camp White because we had none. POW labor helped mitigate these chronic wartime labor shortages, um, but in line with the Geneva Convention, they couldn't work for free. So each of these men that went and worked were paid 80 cents per day. Um, typically this was paid in canteen coupons and they were directly barred from doing any work related to the war effort. So we couldn't send POWs to work in a munitions factory, for example. But food is, is one of those necessities of life and even if the food was going to soldiers, it wasn't viewed as something related to the war. Prisoners typically use their earnings to purchase um, things like candy, tobacco, crackers, and soft drinks, as well as other products in the canteen to make their lives a bit more comfortable. Camp White prisoners also had an entitlement, again under the Geneva Convention, to send two letters and four postcards per month. All materials were subject to censorship, although it was very loosely applied. Um, despite these limits, see if I can move forward here, Prisoners maintained pretty active correspondence with their friends and loved ones back home and generally wrote positive things about their American captors and camp life. Um, unfortunately, this really doesn't say anything, even if you do speak German. It just is listing the addresses. 
So no mystery there. <clears throat> Part of this positive correspondence contributed to the large number of late war surrenders of Germans to the Americans. When faced with the choice of having those Russians on one side or the Americans capture them, oftentimes toward the end, most would run west and try and run into the American lines rather than be caught by the Russians. POWs were also able to receive mail, um, including books, care packages with food and clothes from home, and even mail order goods from American businesses. So I, I almost want to be a captive. <laughs> this, this is starting to get really comfortable here. Most of them also, uh, or if not most, many subscribed to newspapers and magazines to entertain themselves as well. Um, the Oregonian and life were popular, and few tended to interpret them as propaganda. They just kind of took them for what they were. German language newspapers were also allowed, although they were somewhat more limited. Um, and a camp favorite was Heimat, which was a journal published by the PFWs themselves. So they had the ability to make their own news. Um, Heimat translates as home, and it is imbued with many of the same connotations as home in English. So it complicates a really direct translation. But just think of all the things that home makes you think of. It applies the same in German. So for a POW stuck in a faraway land. That is the perfect name for the prisoner journal. In September 1945, Oregonian reporter Herman Edwards interviewed Camp White's POWs, along with the American Lieutenant Fahey. Edwards confirmed what many prisoners had voiced earlier by writing that the prisoners assert their belief that Nazism is through, but they argue that democracy cannot work in Germany. So here they're having really heated conversations about what post-war Germany is going to look like and how it's going to be structured. By this point, um, with a slightly more objective understanding of current events than had been available in Germany under Hitler's propaganda machine, Heimat's editor, Werner Baker, added to this observation by admitting that the Germans, these Camp White prisoners, had been led on to some extent by Hitler's promises after what had appeared to be chaos during Germany's brief and only first-hand experience with Republican-style government. He said that older men generally come more readily to these realizations. The younger men who knew nothing but Nazism are less easily convinced, he said. So that kind of confirms that age mattered in this ideological perspective among the prisoners. By 1945, as Edwards conducted his interviews, the POW population in the Rogue Valley peaked at over 2,000. So that's where we hit our maximum. George Kramer, in his book on Camp White, confirms that we have this general ideological bent of the group, um, suggesting that rather than hardcore Nazis, they were predominantly draftees. Uh, he says, none too rabid in their devotion to Hitler. Historian Arnold Kramer, not to be confused with George Kramer, suggests that in the end, there was really no such thing as the typical prisoner of war experience in the United States. The diversity of experience among these prisoners, as well as the geographical and structural differences in the camps, leads many um, potential avenues for further research on this local level for more camp-specific studies. Um, for example, they plucked all of the really virulent Nazis out of camps, like Camp White, and they contained them, segregated them in their own camps. And so that's something that looks vastly different from this very lax security, very easygoing attitude that we had in Camp White. So Camp White itself did represent a somewhat more typical structure of a camp um, because of this. Um, the War Department did segregate the really virulent Nazis. Um, <clears throat> Walter Escanodas was one of the ones who was taken out of Camp White and deported to one of these other camps. Um, this was also not an officer camp, and it held this diverse array of enlisted men captured at various points and at various locations during the war, and that's pretty typical for most other camps. Additionally, Camp White only held German POWs and did not mix Italian or Japanese prisoners. Um, German prisoners comprised about 371,000 out of the approximately 425,000 Axis prisoners of war. And so they make up um, just over 87% of the total that we had on U.S. soil. In the end, the prisoners at Camp White appear to have been pretty pleased with their captors, as this birthday card suggests. It says, Herzlichen Glückwunsch zum Geburtstag. So they're saying that's the mouthful way in German just to say happy birthday. And we can see all these, all these captives here are signing it to Steve. Whoever Steve was, he was turning 53 and they wanted him to know it. So. 
This was not always the case in other camps. And so Camp White really stands out as a good example of the way we treated our soldiers, um, even though they were enemy combatants. The last POWs at Camp White left in May 1946. Um, first they traveled north to Seattle, and then by train east to New York City. From there they embarked on ships to return them to Europe. This was also a pretty complicated process and not everybody went straight home. They typically had to hit a few points along the way as everyone was processed and reorganized. So the serial numbers came in handy at this point. As a testament to their positive experiences in the custody of the U.S., some former POWs came back and settled permanently in the United States. Heinz Bertram was an Africa Corps fighter who arrived in Camp White in April 1944 with the first big group, had trained as an upholsterer in Germany. Um, Bertram came back here and opened Linda Park Upholstery in Medford in 1954 with his German wife. Otto Scholand was captured in the aftermath of the Allied Normandy invasions, and he arrived in Camp White in September 1944 and returned to the U.S. with his new bride in the same year as Bertram. Gerhard Wagner, right here, was captured in the Battle of the Bulge and lived and worked first in Wales before his return um, to Germany in 1950, and then he emigrated back out, traveling first to Canada and then to the U.S., where he retired in California in 1968. These moves may not really have any basis in the perceived success of democracy. Um, interestingly enough, all three of these gentlemen's homes fell behind the descending Iron Curtain. So if you know anything about the differences between East and West Germany, I don't need to say any more. But for those of you that aren't familiar, um, these men were mostly escaping the Russians at this point in time. Um, and I could say communism, but it's more appropriately Stalinism. Um, if you're curious about that, I'm happy to answer more questions about the way the dynamics changed, but I don't have enough time right now. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So overall, the overwhelmingly kind and hospitable treatment experienced by these German enemy prisoners stands in stark contrast to the brutal war that precluded their presence here. The story of Camp White's prisoners allows for an illuminating historical analysis of these complex wartime political and social dynamics. At their core, ideologies such as Nazism did not necessarily define the men fighting under the fascist flag, and the many interesting anecdotes of German POWs in Camp White that the local residents continue to tell are much better placed within the context of the men's humanity and ability to adapt to their circumstances rather than the intangible national ideologies of the time. So hopefully I've been able to make these men a little bit more real for you. Um, that's all I have. Thank you.